Hello, um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Stephen Barton. I am one of the product managers here at ARM, and I look after some of the GPUs that um, ARM develop. Today, I'm going to talk to you about AI and the immersive experience and bringing what's traditionally premium content down into the mainstream space. We're going to look at four of the announced products that were recently announced. I'm going to look at the display processor and the graphics processor, and then I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Jim Davies, that you may remember from the keynote this morning, who's going to talk about the machine learning products. Okay, so why are we here today? And I suppose I've just given you kind of a brief introduction to that, but we are extending all of our premium content down into the mainstream space, and we are looking at four different pieces of IP. We are looking at the EFOS N57 and the EFOS N37. And um, this is to look at vision, voice, all on machine learning. And um, we are starting to look at use cases coming down to the premium. Machine learning needs to be everywhere. So you'll want to be able to do voice recognition on your DTV or your display, uh, your television. And you'll also want to be able to do kind of face recognition on your mainstream devices. Looking at the Mali G57 GPU, this is the first Valhall architecture GPU for mainstream. This allows you to do 4K, 8K, DTV UI, and AR and high fidelity gaming. Paired with this is the Mali D37 which is the mainstream ultra-efficient DPU. This allows you to do 2K content, 1080p content, at 60 hertz or 60 FPS, whilst making a very small area budget, so it all can be done in less than a millimeter squared. We're gonna to talk to you about these products, and then at the end, we'll kind of open the floor up to questions as well. Okay, so I've already started by speaking about how we want to take premium experiences down into mainstream, but is this something that we even need to do? Well, entertainment is definitely pushing us in this direction. So we are looking at high fidelity gaming. People and developers and customers want to bring premium gaming from consoles or the desktop space down from the console onto your mainstream device. A key example of this will be Fortnite, where people are playing Fortnite on their console, and then they want to take that experience with them um, through the mobile. Second one we've already mentioned is the machine learning needs to be everywhere. You need to be doing voice recognition on your telly, as I mentioned, or your television, and you want to be doing face unlock on your mainstream devices and also AR and VR are putting strain and demands on the mainstream system, so we need to go down from the premium space down into the mainstream for that reason as well. But we can't just do it with hardware alone. It's gonna take hardware, software, and the ecosystem. Um, and at the moment, I'm just gonna focus on the hardware, but my colleague, Jem, is gonna speak about the ecosystem and software a little bit later on. So, speaking of hardware, what does the next mainstream solution, or indeed ultra-efficient solution, look like from ARM? So, if we start with the mainstream solution, you look, you've got your Cortex-A77 and your Cortex-A55. Paired with the Mali G57, EFOS N57, and you've got your Mali D37 display, with also ARM's dis assertive display technology in there as well. Now, if you look at the ultra-efficient solution, you'll notice there are a lot of similarities. You stay with the Cortex-A55. You will still use the Mali-G57 in some of your ultra-efficient solutions. The reason for this is that you can configure the Mali-G57 from one core to six core. So for your ultra-efficient solution, you may be looking at more like the one or the two-core variant, 
and then for your mainstream you'll be going into your 5 or your 6 car. EFOS N37, um, the machine learning processor, is actually designed with ultra-efficient um, use cases in mind. And you'll also notice that the Mali D37 also makes an appearance in the ultra-efficient space. This is again due to the fact that it is the most area-efficient DPU that ARM has done, and it still allows you to have your 2K and your 1080p um, content as well. Okay, so moving on to talking about the GPU, and this is the headline that Mali G57 has got 30% better performance than the Mali G52. Now, this is more than just per core level, or per engine level. We do this per core. The reason for this is there's been substantial changes all throughout the core to be able to deliver this performance. Most of the work comes from coming from Valhalla architecture that allows a lot more compute. But there's also changes to the texture mapper and the texture unit. Now gives you up to four texels per cycle. And there's also changes in the load store cache that basically allows you to get twice the amount of data in half the time. So let's talk a little bit more about the Valhalla architecture and what changes we've actually made to actually get to that 30%. So if we look at the diagrams on the right, you'll see an evolution of the execution engine, starting with the G51, where we had a four wide per engine, four watt wide, at three engines per core, moving to the Mali G52, which has two sets of four lanes, so it's eight wide per engine. And now moving on to the actual Mali G57 in the Valhalla architecture. You'll notice now we have 16 lanes and we have two clusters per engine. One thing to note here is the area of the Mali G52 and the area of the Mali G57 is roughly the same. What this means is you're getting a lot more compute for the same area and that's increasing your performance density. Also, um, we have now got a simplified and compiler friendly instruction set. So in the past, Bifrost, our previous architecture, was quite strict on how you use your instructions. We've removed that, in, uh, that restriction, which allows the compiler to actually schedule things a lot better and the hardware to do some dynamic scheduling as well. So these are reasons why you get the performance. It, the uh, Valhalla architecture is also aligned to new APIs such as Vulkan. So when developers move over to Vulkan-based content to go for that high fidelity games that we spoke about, this is an easy method to success. So, we mentioned that we've got 30% better performance, but it doesn't stop there. We also have 30% better energy efficiency. So why is this important? Well, one of the goals is to get, if you're into gaming, to, to have an immersive experience, is to hit the refresh rate of your screen, which is typically 60. So you strive to have 60 frames per second. When you bring content down from um, console and desktop, chances are that your GPU is going to be quite busy, and it'll be using quite a bit of power. So for you to be able to keep with uh, people playing your games for longer, having an extra battery life, you need to have a good energy efficiency. Second reason for this is that you will also, if you have got a power budget, which let's face it, every single kind of SOC does, you'll be able to use the same amount of power and get 30% better performance and this comes into the energy and performance density as well. The second point is performance density. So you have an area budget, an area is king in mainstream, and you'll notice that you'll be able to do 30% more performance in exactly the same area budget on your mainstream devices. The 
final point is on machine learning. So all of that extra compute power that we're giving you by having your 16 wide warps, two of them, and the improvements to the load store cache that I mentioned earlier, allows you to get 60% improvement on machine learning. Now you'll notice these three numbers and the performance number on the previous slide. Where did we actually get those numbers from? Well, we actually run um, our tests on a variety of different content. So we'll run them on things that are out in the market at the moment, such as Honor of Kings and Fortnite. And we typically take Eastern and Western content to make sure that we get a good representation of what is out there, as well as the usual benchmarks as well. OK, moving on to display. And this gives you kind of a history of ARM's display roadmap, and, or display journey, as we've written in this slide. We started off in tw 2013 with the DP500. And this had three composition layers, supported the AFBC, and had a trusted layer. From that point, we focused on increasing performance, as well in as increasing the feature set. So it's about bringing those premium features back down into mainstream. You can see that we've gone from 1080p all the way up to 4K. We've gone from three layers up to eight layers. And you can actually drive two different um, screens as well at the same time. Also allowed a, a CPI or co-processor uh, co interface that allows you to connect to third party IP as well as well as the assertive display by ARM, which allows you to do local and global tone mapping. If we look from 2017, this is when we first introduced the Comedo architecture. And this is present in the Mali D37 as well. And this allows you a lot of advanced features, such as HDR, AFBC encoding, all to keep that system performance and system power consumption going down. Going on, moving on to the D37, what's changed? Well, we've actually took the Comedia architecture and we've actually optimized it for mainstream. We've took out one of the displays and we've gone down to four layers. But the main key point here is that we've made it less than a millimeter squared, a 16 nanometer process. So you get all of those premium features, your HDR and uh, scaling and composition, all available in the mainstream space. So this is kind of the summary slide for the display. It is, delivers 2K and full HD in a small area of less than a millimetre on 16 nanometer. And then you get 30% system power saving with memory management as well. So this allows you, you can connect it to the MMU 600, which allows you to get less latency and memory optimizations. And you can offload work from your GPU to get a 30% power saving. Or you can just free up the GPU to do other work. Again, you get all of your premium features. You get connection to your assertive display. You can do rotation with AFBC. That is all included. And there is one big use case for this. So when you are using a mobile phone, you can look and you'll be watching some video content on portrait mode. And you turn it 90 degrees to actually watch it in landscape because you want to see a lot more of the screen. This sounds like a simple operation. But in terms of display processor, it's really complex. And some of the features here, including the FBC encoding, reduces the system bandwidth and allows a lot of energy saving when you are actually doing that rotation, as well as other things. OK, I'm going to move over to Gem now. Thank you, Stephen. My name's Gem Davis. I'm the general manager of ARM's machine learning group. And I'm here to talk to you today about some of our machine learning devices. The ARM AI platform is one of choice. We allow the different people to do different things 
depending on their circumstance. We believe that one size does not fit all and therefore we provide a variety of hardware options for the same ML workloads. For different people, a number of factors determine whether you would use a CPU, a GPU, or an NPU, and this could be performance, power, cost, air, silicon area, the usual. For example, a, mis a mis particular machine learning inference task could run on all three types of processor at different elapsed run times and different uh, energy consumptions and different performance in terms of inferences per second. We see a general trend that more and more machine learning is being present to be executed on our processors and we see that typically as one uses higher performance levels of machine learning, high performance IP like NPUs, neural network processing units, comes more and more important to complete these tasks. We have a range of scalable IP and different IP products for different market segments. Today we've introduced the ARM Ethos NPU family to bring those machine learning capabilities to every market segment. The ARM Ethos N77 NPU, which was formally announced at Computex as the ARM ML processor, is now named properly and is targeted for the premium segment delivering best-in-class throughput and best-in-class efficiency. The ARM Ethos N57 NPU brings that capability to the mainstream of mobile and client devices, offering a balance of performance and cost efficiency. And finally, the ARM Ethos N37 is targeted for extremely cost-sensitive design wins particularly where very low DRAM bandwidth availability can be a problem. The ARM Ethos NPU family is designed to support the widest variety of requirements, in, particularly in mobile applications. They are general purpose NPUs which can run any deep neural network and so can support both vision and audio and, and speech use case applications. In DTV, that might include super resolution. In the camera, it might include object detection, image classification, and so on. At the lower end, we often see a single use case, perhaps a surveillance camera, just doing one thing, like uh, object detection, and very resource constrained. Typically, they also have very limited DRAM bandwidth or very low-cost DRAM interfaces. And so the Ethos N37 is designed specifically to keep that bandwidth as low as possible. Applications like mainstream smartphones or smart home hubs have multiple use cases running in parallel, and so they need more computational power. And the Ethos N57 is ideally suited to running those where you have the right balance of performance, DRAM bandwidth, power consumption, silicon area. And finally, of course, up in the uh, premium mobile, Ethos N77, with its four teraops per second performance and five teraops per watt power efficiency, provides the greatest power and area efficiency. And there, there are likely to be running multiple applications in parallel, running multiple use cases. Many of our silicon partners will want to buy the IP to scale across a number of different performance points and a number of different market segments. And so the scalable IP that we provide here, scaling all of these use cases, we believe will be extremely attractive. Looking at that in summary then, Ethos N77, going up to four teraops per second at a gigahertz on, on uh, 16 nanometer processes containing one to four megabytes configurable of internal SRAM, right down to Ethos N37 at one teraop per second and only half a megabyte of internal SRAM. 
All of these numbers are, of course, traditionally with ARM the worst case, and in fact, many of our silicon partners will achieve much higher frequencies and much higher performance. We've built them all from a common, scalable hardware architecture, and they all, of course, run the ARM NN software stack, which I will talk more about later. The main challenge in designing a neural network processor is often about the data management. And so, therefore, we bring our heritage of compression technologies from our GPUs into play. Our NPUs were designed with compression at the heart of their design right from the start. Both the weights from the neural network model and the activations from the incoming data are compressed built into our software and our hardware. The data is stored compressed in DRAM and read compressed and stored compressed so that we can minimize the data bandwidth needed, which also has an effect on reducing the system power. Another feature we've added to provide even greater levels of performance is support for the Winograd transform to improve throughput on very common convolutional kernels and also taking advantage of sparsity to perform zero gating uh, to further reduce power in the system. But of course, all of this hardware needs software, the best possible software, to extract the maximum amount of performance and efficiency out of it. On the machine learning side, of course, we have our open source standard of ARMNN. Last year, we donated ARMNN to the Linaro standards body to ensure that the industry could align around ARMNN and could contribute to it and we could share development around that. This has been taken up very popularly. You'll find ARMNN being used right the way across the industry now as a common software inference engine that bridges the gap between the neural network frameworks like PyTorch, CAFE, uh, and so on, TensorFlow, and bridging the gap between those frameworks and the hardware. We support all of the most popular frameworks, and this allows third-party IP developers to use their favorite developer frameworks, and if necessary, they can also add their own support into the ARMNN framework. The ecosystem is central to everything we do. We need partnerships with strong companies developing things around the ARM architectures. And so I'd just like to uh, draw your attention to an announcement we made of a new partnership with Unity that's going to improve the developer experience. Unity is one of the most influential 3D uh, content creation companies, and they share our vision. They have over 50% share in Android games and 70% share in VR content. And that collaboration deal we signed with them is to create a better developer experience by pre-integrating the support for ARM technology directly into the Unity platform. And this delivers the highest levels of ARM performance by default from within that Unity toolchain. And there we can see the summary of our partnership there, enabling the Unity creators to improve the best possible silicon performance within their own native environment, getting the best performance across ARM CPUs, ARM GPUs, and ARM NPUs. Because for us to be successful, all of us to be successful together in this partnership, we must make the developers' lives as easy as possible to gain those best performance. So I'd like to say thank you for your time uh, this afternoon and to open the floor to questions.